when I was uh, a bit younger, I thought I could learn lots of languages, <laughs> but I have a hard enough time with English. And so I came up and tried four years of Greek and uh, learned to read and write and do a little bit of um, research. But my classmates in Greek class were convinced that I only passed Greek because the teacher liked me. So uh, I wish that I could understand uh, the song that you just sang. But I could tell by the expression of the others in the congregation that was a loving and gentle and soothing message of the song. And uh, God bless all of you. And you know that um, when it comes to understanding public worship, congregational worship, uh, it is important to note that whether we pray from the front, whether we read the Bible, or whether we sing, we do it on behalf of the entire congregation. This is not an audience, and this is not a performance. Amen. This is worship, and that is worship, and we worship together. So when somebody lifts up their voice, it is on behalf of the entire congregation. It is for that reason that there is no applause in worship. It is only in entertainment when somebody is performing and there is an audience. The audience likes what they note and they clap. But in worship, there is no applause as such because when I sing or when appropriately, when Nirmala sings, it's because it's sing for all of us. It is always a burden to preach. Burden in the sense that it is a responsibility where the person who stands here can say something that can mislead the congregation or even one person. What is said here can bring somebody to an understanding of God and the Holy Spirit, God, through His Spirit, can bring somebody to God. But likewise, somebody can say something that is not presented in a way to make a mistake. And somebody could lose their relationship with God. And so it is every time somebody stands here to preach and open the Word of God, it is with fear and trembling that we may say the right things. And that God's name and knowledge be lifted up. I'm going to ask Vivid to turn the microphone off, only because I'm not going to stand here and it'll mess up our sound. It is important for us to note that it is the desire of this congregation and the leaders of this congregation to formulate our activities here following the will of God in all aspects of it. And by that what we mean is this, that we come here to worship God. In order to worship God, some things are pre-required, there's a prerequisite for biblical worship. And that prerequisite is this. We have to know who it is that we are worshiping. If we don't understand who it is that we are worshiping, we have no idea who we are. It is only in comparison to God and His Highness and His Holiness and His Power that we acknowledge and realize who we are. And it's when we see who He is, we are made to submit. And only in an attitude of submission can worship be done. We cannot worship unless we are humble. Then, in order to worship, we have to understand what worship is. Not 
worship by how it is explained by a certain denomination, or not worship as how it is explained by a certain person, or not worship by how explained by a mega church pastor, but what is worship that is desired by God, because only that worship is acceptable to God, which is a de desired by God. So it is He who defines what worship is. There are those who would like to tell us that worship is an action, it is an activity. It is an activity. But those activities involved in worship are only the visible and audible results of the condition of the heart. Our actions only become worship when our heart is in worship. When our heart is not in worship, those actions become offensive to God. And it is for that reason that we have started, we've only, this is the third week here, and last week we started a series on the holiness of God. And we will continue for a couple of weeks. Because it is when we see the holiness of God, that in contrast to the holiness of God, I can see my sinfulness and my need to be holy through Jesus Christ. Because if I come to God without knowing His holiness, I cannot see my sinfulness and my need of Jesus Christ. We haven't started the sermon yet, by the way. We're just saying hello. I know last week I preached much too long, because a whole bunch of people told me, if you keep preaching like that, you're going to get fired. So i got to be careful. First of all, let us define what it means to be holy. I know you folks have been studying on Friday nights, a deep Bible study, and we have discussed what holiness is. So now we're going to have a pop quiz and we're going to see if any of you remember. What is holiness? Come on, don't be shy. Tell me. Set apart. Set apart. Sanctified. Sanctified. This was a theologian. <laughs> Not just set apart, she used a theological term which speaks the same thing. Set apart. Set apart from what? Unholy. From? Unholy. Unholiness. Set apart from unholiness. So God called Israel a holy people. And He sanctified them and He set them away and from the rest of the world. We hear the word remnant. Remnant of those who are set apart and those are the remainder of those that are holy that the rest of the world has chosen to be unholy. We have places that are holy. Moses walked into the forest there and saw a burning bush and a voice came out of the bush saying what? Stop! Take off your shoes because the ground where you're standing is holy ground. Why is that holy? Because it is God is there and it is set apart. We come into the sanctuary here and we behave differently, I hope, than we behave elsewhere. Because what? This place is holy and set apart. Clothes. There are some clothes that you can't be wearing in church. I know we're not supposed to say stuff like that. One day, after we get past this holiness of God, we're going to talk about our appearance when we come before God. You have to be cautious. You have to be conscious. When you come into the presence of God, you have to have an attitude that is of submission and transform. I told you once before, and I have to remember this. I don't over the years, I've met lots of celebrities and politicians and even prime ministers, but I've never really been one to take pictures and put them at my house. 
But there's one thing that I'm going to uh, frame, uh, I hope, one day, except my dog ate part of it. Uh, only because it looks so nice. It's a letter. It's a letter from Prime Minister Harper inviting me to visit Prime Minister Modi of India when he came two years ago in May. And I want you to know that when I got that letter, soon after that I got a phone call and I got an e asking for an email, then I got a bunch of emails wanting to know this, 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 this about me, and then wanted my information, my, uh, uh, oh, my passport number, my driver's license, and uh, a whole bunch of other things. What? Oh, they want to do a security check. They invite me, and then they want to do a security check. Hey, you could have done a security check before. <laughs> now I'm going to be embarrassed if you say you can't come. Security check. Oh, what is it about that important? Then I began to think, oh my goodness, uh, what am I going to wear? I'm going to be in the presence of two prime ministers. What in the world am I going to wear? I was worried about it. I even went to a store, Harry Rosen, to see if I could buy a really nice suit. And I was only going to be there for a little while. And yet, when we come to meet God, we come casually. We come without giving thought and preparing our hearts. Our garments, what we wear, how we wear them, suggest the condition of our heart. So please don't object when God tells us that we ought to look like this, or look like this, or look like this. God expects that I take what is special, set aside for His presence. In the Old Testament, Levit Leviticus, He told the priests, you can wear a certain kind of cloth. They could wear four garments, and the people had to give the money for those garments, special garments. Couldn't wear wool, had to be cotton. Had to be natural. And how to wear it. Required by God. But when it comes to holiness, we can have things that are holy, people that are holy, believe it or not, there are people who think they are holy, and there are other people who think that those other people are holy. Did you know that? But yeah. Some people think the Pope is holy. Some people think the President of the General Conference is holy. Some people think their own pastor is holy. God forbid. But when we talk about holiness, we talk about separateness from something that is sinful. By the way, is there a word called separateness? Or did I just make that up? I told you I have a problem with language. <laughs> Now, what about the holiness of God? How is the holiness of God separated from the rest of sin? Where does the holiness of God come from? From where? The holiness that we get. If God took the people of Israel and He set them aside and made them holy, where did their holiness come from? It came from... God, when He takes a place and He sets it aside and He makes it holy, where does that holiness come from? God. When He takes His clothes and He makes them holy, where does that holiness come from? God. Where does the holiness of God come from? He is the source of all holiness. He is not separated from anything. But everything is separated from Him. He is above all. He is transcendent of all. He is greater than all. He is mightier than all. And in all of His attributes, God is holy and perfect. People say, and the Bible says, God is love. Love is one of the attributes of God. What else is an attribute of God? What makes Him God? Tell me. I know you guys are all hard. Uh, studying theologians. So tell me, some of the attributes of God. What makes God God? He's what? He's what? Merciful. Omnipotent. 
said, that's such a big word. What does that mean? <laughs> All powerful. And he's omnipresent. But that means what? Everywhere. Like a TV station. Omni. Everywhere. Omni. What? Um, immutable? Omniscient? That's even a more fancy word. Science meaning knowledge. Huh? Alpha and Omega. You guys are serious, man. Huh? I think I'm going to sit down. You guys know this stuff. God is all those things. But we have powerful nations who are all powerful. We are know those that are really, really smart. Right now, the smartest person I know is named Google. Google knows everything. But beyond all these things that define God, and every one of those attributes that defines God is covered by His holiness. His mercy is holy. His knowledge is holy. His power is holy. His Alpha and Omega is holy. There is nothing about God that is not holy. It is therefore that most of all, He is holy. He is holy. Without Him, there is no holiness. No holiness. And it is His character that is projected in His law. It is an image of God that is projected in His law. In that, He is love. He is love. All the commandments show the love of God. Commandments 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And so what does covetousness have to do with love? If you have love, you don't covet. You're satisfied. The first four commandments talk about the greatness of God. How great He is. So the Ten Commandments project the image of God. So when we say knowing God, we know the God. We know our only God through the Ten Commandments. Through the commandments of God. We see the glory of God on this earth. When Isaiah chapter 1, chapter 6 says that the, the, the entire temple, the sanctuary was filled with the garment of God. The garment of God, the glory of God throughout the world, throughout the universe. In the stars in the sky, in the sun and the moon. In the trees around us. In the animals that we see around us. In the cells, in the amoeba, in science, in cells, in, 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 in atoms. We see the power and the glory of God. We see the glory of God. That is God. For the sake of our study of the holiness of God, we're going to reside for a little while in chapter 6 of Isaiah. And then from there, we're going to travel here, travel there a little bit, but come back. Uh, one day, I went for a trip to Pakistan, and uh, lucky for me, I wasn't paying the bill. Uh, they put me up in a top floor of the Marriott, which where all the, they kept the important people. I don't know why they reserved a spot there, but that was a spot for me for, for a few weeks. But while I was there in uh, Islamabad, I went in the area, I got to travel to Lahore, and then come back. Uh, 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 Karachi, and come back. Went to India for a little while, and come back. That was my central spot. So today our central spot is going to be, or oh, for a few weeks our central spot is going to be Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to travel from here into some other passages and come back to this. Because this is the most important passage in my opinion, in studying the holiness of God. So we go to Isaiah chapter 6. And there, verse 1. In the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a the, on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling one to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. 
and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from t with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. I'm going to read a portion of this that we did not read last week. This is verse 9 onward. He said, this is now after the lips of Isaiah have been touched by the coal. He's been cleansed and he's ready to go and work for God. God said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, O Lord? He answered, Until the cities lie ruined, and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But at the terebinth and oak, leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. The holy seed will be the stump in the land. King Isaiah became king in the age of, how old was he? Oh, the Bible scholars have fallen asleep. How old was he? I think he was 16. Just a little guy. How, how old was he? Was he eight? Oh, he was ruling for how many years? 54. 54. He was just a kid. And as he was king, he was a very successful king. And he built all kinds of roads and highways and palaces. And uh, he built uh, the city. And he fortified the city. And he had big armies. Big, big armies. He became so successful. And he became so proud of his success. That... Let's go now to Second Chronicles and read chapter Second Chronicles chapter twenty six. Let's read verse sixteen. But after Uzziah became powerful, his pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord his God and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Azariah the priest with 80 other courageous priests of the Lord followed him in. They confronted him and said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful. And you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the priests, in their presence, before the incense altar, in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. But Azariah, the chief priest, and all the other priests looked at him, they saw that he had leprosy on his forehead. So they hurried him out. Indeed, he himself was eager to leave because the Lord had afflicted him. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous, and excluded from the temple of the Lord. Jo Jotham, his son, had charged of the palace and governed the people of the land. For the first 16 years, he ruled, co-ruled with his father. 
And after that, he was a king by himself. And then, he became so proud. And with that pride, he forgot his own status. He forgot who he was. He thought that he could go into the presence of God where God had said not to go. You are not consecrated to go and light the incense. You are not to go before the Lord and represent yourself. You are unholy. God was so high and holy that Isaiah, a chosen of God, one of the best kings of Israel, high and mighty, loved by the people, walked into the sanctuary and began to try to communicate with God through the sacrifice. God rejected his sacrifice. You know why? Because Uzziah didn't see his condition of sinfulness. It tells us in verse 16, that his heart was full of pride. Pride. You cannot go before God with hearts that are full of pride. If Isaiah had recognized and remembered who God was, he would have known what his status was. And he would not have dared to go before God. When he died. At this time, he was separated from the people. He had to go live someplace, someplace else away. But when he died, we are told that there was great sorrow in the land. There was great sorrow in the land. And the year was marked as a dark and terrible year because the king Uzziah died in that year. And it is in that year that God chose Isaiah to prophesy on behalf of him, to prophesy on behalf of God. In the same year that Isaiah died, Isaiah started to prophesy on behalf of God. And man who thought himself as unholy and unfit, look at the difference. One is a king who goes to the altar to put incense and worship and God curses him. Isaiah, on the other hand, looks at God and sees this, this vision and he says, God, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live like among the people of unclean lips. And God goes to the altar and he picks up a coal through one of his seraphs. And he touches his lips and he makes him holy. It is when we recognize and acknowledge our sinfulness that God can do something. And when we neglect to acknowledge our status, God takes us and He separates us. But not to be holy, like He separated Isaiah, to be unholy, away from those that were His people. Interestingly enough, in the same year that Isaiah died, that same plan of God that was given to Isaiah starting in this year, the plan that God will send a Savior, God began the plans for that government that would crucify that Savior. It was in this year that King Isaiah died that there was a small village in Italy that was actually started that same year. A little, little village called Rome was started in the year the death of King Isaiah. In that, when God, the year that God chose Isaiah to prophesy on behalf of Jesus, the plan of God also started a place that would govern the area where Jesus would be crucified. Look at the plans, the details of God. I want to turn your attention to Exodus. Chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verse 9. This is God preparing His people, telling His people how to prepare to meet Him. And who are these people? 
These are people that, that have already seen the workings of God. Where did these people see the workings of God? In Egypt, the ten plagues. They had seen the sea parted. They had been fed manna. They had seen the cloud by day that protected them and the pillar of fire by night that gave them light. These are people that knew God. They had seen the power of God. Now they are going to meet God in a different setting. But please pay attention. Verse 9 of chapter 19 in the book of Isaiah. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. By the way, prior to this, God has already gone back and forth with Moses to tell him that I will want to make an arrangement with you for you to become my special people. And Moses had already talked and made an offer to the people of Israel earlier in chapter 19. So now that they have had a basic understanding, now they're going to get a little bit more serious about it. And this is God calling his people to himself. And verse 10, And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, Be careful that you do not go up the mountain, or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. He shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Not a hand is to be laid on him. Whether man or animal, he will not be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they go up to the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day, abstain from sexual relations. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp did what? They trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of the mountain, Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up, and the Lord said to him, Go down and warn the people so that they do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many, and many will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Who is worthy to approach God? Who is worthy to approach God? It says three days. Prepare your hearts for three days. Do you remember when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? And he went, he said, go to this certain place. How many days was he traveling? Three days. To prepare his heart. To sacrifice and worship God in that sacrifice. Three days. Search your heart. Search your heart. And see who you are compared to who God is. It is when we see and recognize and acknowledge the holiness of God that we can see who we are. Now take note what happens to the people. Moses goes up. The people can see God. They can hear. They can see the fire. They can see the smoke. When Moses goes up there for 40 days and 40 nights, the people can still see the smoke. They can hear the thunderings. When Moses comes back, what are they doing? They have forsaken their God. They have forsaken their God. 
Even when we see the workings of God, we forsake our God. Because we begin to measure our holiness in a different way. They reject God. Isaiah is told, go and preach to the people. And then God says, you're going to preach, but the people are going to reject what you say. Just like Moses preached, he told them, here's what's going to happen. They said, we will do it. When they came back, they'd already forsaken God. Isaiah said, I will go. Here am I, send me. God purified them, made them holy. Like he prepared Moses. But when he goes to preach, we're told that the people's hearts were hardened and they rejected. But God said that a tenth will not reject. And when all the trees are taken down, meaning all the people are rejected and gone, a stump will remain out of which will grow the remnant. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. In the book of John, the first 12 chapters summarize the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. After chapter 12, John gets a little more involved in trying to convince non-believers. However, I want you to go to verse 41 with me, John chapter 12. John refers back to Isaiah. John refers back. Let me go to verse 39 instead. And give us a little bit more context. Verse 39. For this reason they could not believe. Because, as Isaiah says elsewhere, we just read that, didn't we? As Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. We want to fit in with the men and women of the world. We want to fit in with the common. We don't want to be separated from the common. We prefer to stay with the common. But to be, to be holy, we have to be separated. We prefer the praise of God rather than the praise of man. John says people rejected the gospel. And as I have predicted, when as I have said that Jesus is going to come, his message was rejected. And he prophesied that those that hear the message of Christ will also reject it. It's a message to us. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, there are seven churches. Which is the last of the seven churches? I know you all know this. Who? Somebody said it. Who? Huh? Laodicea. Laodicea. Laodicea is the last church. And what does the Bible say about the church, the last church? Who is the Laodicea, by the way? Who is living in the last seventh, the, 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 the seventh church? It is this is the time of Laodicea. The six churches' prophecies have been fulfilled. The Bible says this about Laodicea: You are blind, and you are deaf. Buy of me eye salve that you may see. Revelation. Is this not what John just said? He has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts so they could neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts. It's talking about us. In this time, here and now, this message of holiness and unholiness is about me. I'm blind, I cannot see. So 
So I have to buy the eye stuff that I can see, that I may accept that I am sinful. It also says in Revelation, buy a robe because you are naked. Where else do we see somebody admitting their nakedness? Do you remember? This is the end of the Bible. We saw it in the beginning of the Bible. When Adam and Eve were together with God, they were what? Were they holy or unholy? They were holy. When they were separated by God, they became what? Unholy. unholy. And when they became unholy, when they say that they saw that they were naked, that means that they were without the protection of the holiness of God. They were sinful. They acknowledged that they were separated from God. They could no longer be in the presence of God. So God put them away. And the same nakedness shows up in Revelation says that you are naked, you are sinful. By the robe of righteousness, from whom? Jesus Christ. By the robe of righteousness, that we may be covered, that our nakedness, that our sinfulness may be covered by the white robe of righteousness, of holiness. The holiness that comes from God. How do we buy? The robe of righteousness. How do we buy the ISAP? What do I have? Can I give money? No. There are some preachers, especially on television, who say you give to God and God will give you back tenfold. Really? God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. Amen. He wants all of you. Because when He has your heart, He has everything that you have. The only thing that I can offer to God is my dirty, nasty, sinful self. And say, here God, here I am, like Isaiah said. I am a man of unclean lips. Unclean lips represent sin. All the sin that is in his heart comes out from his mouth, from his lips. So when he says unclean lips, he's unclean inside. I am a man of unclean lips. And so are the people among whom I live. God can take that coal and He purify us, transform us. Now we can say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. That He may be able to transform us. Give us eyesight that we can see our sinfulness. That we can see that we are in need of God. Because without Him, our holiness is as filthy rags. Right? The only holiness that means anything is that holiness that comes from God through Jesus Christ. It brings us back to Him by the plan of salvation that we go back to God through the door that is Jesus Christ. So when we come before God, we come before God not like King Isaiah with pride in our hearts, and we come with humility, like Isaiah said, Dear God, wash us, cleanse us, show us who we are. By looking at God, only by looking at God, that we can remain in humility and ask Him to change us, that we may grow in Him. My prayer for myself. Is the same as for each of us. That may we grow with God every day. Not when we come to church. That we grow with Him in our homes. When we open His Word and we see His righteousness in the Bible. When we see the Bible tell us by beholding, we become changed. Our Sabbath school lesson this morning. By beholding, by seeing who God is, how perfect. As we, in this congregation, as we grow spiritually, our hearts will be transformed. We will become like Peter and John, who stand before the world, the world who will hate us, 
The world will make fun of us. The world will tell us to shut up. And we will have to say, we cannot help but tell you the things that we have seen and we have heard in the Word of God. God bless you. Amen.